come to you from my home uh, in the area where behind me uh, we conducted our first session of Dark Heresy ever. We finally managed to make it happen. The group consisted of myself, the assassin, an arbitrator, sister of battle and finally a scum. So the scum, she was a female as well. Four really quite interesting character concepts it all gelled well. Two of the people, the person playing the sister and the person playing the scum, we'd never gamed with before in role playing, so um, that was a new thing for us. What I do personally, when um, it comes to role playing with somebody, for me fundamentally, what is less important is their experience with role playing or anything like that. And what is more important is, is how I interact with that person if I get on with them well enough. So I would never ever just role play with somebody cold having not known them for a little while, first at least. For, you know, even for a few months at the very least. It was the right sort of thing you want at the table in a role playing session. You know, it's general, it's chatty, it's laughy, but it's concentrated on the task, everybody taking it seriously, nobody doing something uh, to upset the game for others, or enough spotlight, and, no one's stealing the show. This one was called Shattered Hope. Now, some of you may have not heard of that before. In fact, I'm sure a lot of you heresy players out there have probably played your first session as the adventure that comes in the core rulebook. However, Shattered Hope is a PDF that predates the adventure effectively uh, of the core rulebook, a sort of beta adventure, we think, uh, like a free PDF download sort of thing. We thought that was going to be a good thing to do to introduce the entire group who had no heresy experience and two of the players who have had no experience playing Woofrup, which is a very similar uh, game mechanic as well to this. So it was an easy transition. We thought for those who aren't so used to the system, a shorter adventure like this would be very good. I mean, the, the fact that it's beta and that sort of thing is uh, so evident that they don't even really give you uh, um, an amount of experience that you are awarded for completion of the uh, missions. So that tells you something there, doesn't it? So the GM really had to just wing it and work out what it was worth for us. We uh, landed on a planet and we were given a mission, an investigation into something. It became perilous, facing something very nasty indeed. We bested that very, very fast indeed. <laughs> that was very good. We all managed to roll the initiative to go before it, and we killed it before it could strike back, essentially. I unleashed on it with my uh, auto gun as full auto, and I got three good solid shots in on the thing and did it 13 damage. The scum uh, missed with uh, her shotgun. The arbitrator didn't do enough damage to put wounds in on it. It negated enough. And the sister of battle, as you might well imagine, finish the damn thing off. We managed to creep along and, and um, surprise all of the enemies, I won't say what those enemies were, before they could realise our presence. There was a particular point where I managed to find some grenades. This was in the, the camp above before we went in. So I, you know, I did, tossed one out to these four individuals and pretty much blew them all to smithereens, leaving one a bad mess that wasn't dead and he got mopped up really quick when the sister came in and pretty much did a repentance no 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 <laughs> with a gun <laughs> yeah there was a particular moment when we managed to pick up traces of uh, a flammable gas promethium we had to make sure we weren't going to use our weapons fire in that area or we could have hit a tank or something like that and caused a massive explosion killing a lot of us. Managed to uh, 
avoid doing that and avoid uh, combat or silliness that might have befallen a group that were too heavy-handed. It's like, oh, there's an enemy, quick, attack it! But no, 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 wait, it's not hurting us, it's sleeping, it's immobile, best left alone. So yes, there was something in this place that was the cause of it all and we managed to sort that out as well, get to the bottom of it. We had a particular incident where there was a chance of gaining mutation. We came upon a substance, and the substance that was the cause of all of the trouble down here in this damn mine. And I'd already cottoned on to what was happening long before, and I, I made it as a point, and I saw the GM sort of shaking his head, thinking, ah, Rob's done it again. I've got this, I've got, I've got this knack, basically, of, of guessing what is wrong right from the very beginning and like coming up with all these plot lines that even the GM's thought of. Upon exposure to this object there was a chance of gaining a mutation and it was a plus 30 toughness test. It was pretty bad because <laughs> for some reason we were all rolling really high and failing even if it like put us up to toughness 50, 60, 70, whatever it could have taken us to as our base toughness the res we, we were rolling 90-somethings on the dice, and well, that's a big old fail. And so it's the, the degrees of, of failure, and then rolling of a dice, and then see what happens. And pretty much it was getting to the point where we three of the group were going to have mutations. That's what it came down to. We wouldn't be able to do that, especially with a sister of battle present. Two of them, were their hair were going to change colour, and their skin was going to turn um, kind of a marbly grey colour. That's not good news. And what was going to happen to um, Jericus, my assassin, was his head was going to grow three times the size. He was going to gain intelligence and lose perception and fellowship instead, as, as you would if you had a giant head. But we couldn't let that stand. So the way we dealt with that was uh, we spent our fate points to try and re-roll that, that roll, the toughness check. Myself and the scum successfully re-rolled, so we managed to avoid the effects. And thusly, with the fate points you see, our fate points usage for the day, possible things we can re-roll or affect, are down by minus one until they recharge over the, uh, the allotted time given to recharge them. However, our poor arbitrator, who only had two fate points in the beginning, he also failed his re-roll that the fate point spending gave him. So this meant that he was forced to either accept the mutation and get the Sister of Battle on his back, which wouldn't have been funny now, would it? Or spend a fate point and all, uh, stop the thing dead from happening. Just say, well, it never happened. It doesn't actually affect you. You've got off lucky somehow. Wow. You felt it starting to happen, you've resisted. And that's what these fate points are about. Your characters have fate points. The more fate points, the better. It is how fated you are to continue existing and do something amazing in the world. The fate of you. If you happen to succeed in something particularly dangerous or hard, you might actually be awarded fate points, but these things can burn them. And that's what the arbitrator was forced to do. He was forced to actually then burn a fate point, actually burn it permanently. So his fate points went from two to one. So that was a major loss for him, but he's avoided what would basically have been character death immediately. There's nothing in the book that we saw, the GM saw, that actually allows you to burn a fate point to stop a mutation affecting you. But, because this is very similar to Warhammer Fantasy roleplay, the GM was setting, using that as a setting precedent. And because you can do it in that, he said, well, we should be able to do it in this, so we did. And that's really the essence of roleplaying, isn't it? The GM makes a call, makes a decision, keeps the game going, plays things how he sees it. The, what you see in the book, what you see in the adventure, you don't have to play to only that. That constricts you, restricts you, fences you in, and it's, it's up to your GM to then impart his personality upon, upon the written text, which is a dull, boring thing and not very easily subjectable to the uh, flexible nature uh, the duress that, that players' unusual ideas might, might bring upon it. And that's what that GM is. He's the interface, the creator, to, to, to allow that to happen. So as the GM, you really do have license to just break the rules, ignore the book, do what you like for the purpose of your entertainment. 
as a GM, because we, the players, are here for your entertainment. That's what we're here to do. You're not getting to play a character, so you've got to have your fun. We're responsible for your fun. It's up to you to make yourself have fun. Put yourself in a position so you will. So that is the, the results of what happened in the session itself. We're set up really, really nicely now for the next one. Because everybody's super, super busy, we're only going to be able to run this on Sundays because of uh, work commitments and other commitments. And it looks like due to the general busyness of our lives that we're only going to get to run this approximately every fortnight. Then we should be cracking on and then we'll be going into the, uh, the adventure in the core rule book itself. Alright, so enough about that. We are now going to go over and have a chat with the GM and we're going to talk to him about his feelings of GMing this this adventure and GMing in this system for the first time ever. Okay.